Amen, Brother Kurt. Thank you. Uh, we are going to miss uh, Kurt and Sandy. We don't have the piano playing yet until the regular service, but uh, they're going to be heading off next Sunday uh, to England to, be, uh, to go over and see what uh, uh, Lorena is doing in the mission field over there in England. So uh, we've got to be praying for them as they gear up this week to uh, travel that way. And uh, we thank the Lord that he brought uh, Cecil and Joanne Ball into Sunday school today. Don't think you're staying for the regular service, just Sunday school. Is that correct, Cecil? So we have plans for, uh, yes. Okay, so he's got plans for the regular service, but hopefully we'll have them uh, back and be able to fellowship with them uh, some more. So uh, let me open us with prayer, and uh, we'll look at a few scriptures this morning. We are kind of running a little bit late, and I know we have to go get Warren, too. I might give Brother Kurt some keys to do that. Um, but I want to be thinking of Grandpa Allen as he's up there, and that we can reach out to those folks. We have Since we've been up to the nursing home, I think there's been about four or five now people that have made a profession of faith and given their life to the Lord. So... That's pretty exciting, just a little bit of ministry that we've been doing up there. A lady this uh, last Monday uh, committed her life to the Lord, and she actually several weeks before, probably maybe a month ago, had raised her hand and, and wanted to invite the Lord Jesus to be her Savior. But she, I really thought that it, that it was true, but there might have been just a little bit of doubt in her heart. But this Monday... She raised her hand, and she had smiles on her face, and she wanted Jesus as her Savior. So you could tell it was, to me, it seemed this was real, and uh, we look forward to the change that the Lord's going to do in her life. And you know, a lot of those folks, I think, that come into the nursing home, some days they have good days. Josh, you can relate with this a little bit, can't you? Some days they have good days where they really can focus their mind and their heart, and other days they're struggling a little bit, and they can't focus as much those other days, but she, it was clear on Monday, and it just was, it was pretty exciting to see her invite the Lord uh, to be her Savior. So there's still another lady up there I want you to be praying for, though, Jeanette Smith. Jeanette, we offered the gospel to her again, and she said, nope, I'm not ready. So she's not ready yet, but we want the Lord to get a hold of her heart and that the Word of God would pierce her heart, draw her unto himself. So Jeanette Smith, if you remember Jeanette. and uh, Let's uh, pray together for a moment. Father, we just thank you so much, Lord, for this morning that you've given us. We thank you for the sunshine outside, Lord, the warmth that we feel as you begin to warm your earth, Father. Thank you for it. And we thank you for the time in which we live in, Lord, right now, the, the church age, the time of the church, Lord. What a great opportunity, a great time in history, Lord, for us to have been born and to live. Father, thank you so much for that time. And Lord, I want to lift up this morning to you, Alan, as he's up there at the nursing home, Lord, as he's gathering those folks up to get them into the chapel. Lord, that they would have a sweet time of fellowship, that they'll be able to be a part of our service right here, Lord, via that live stream. Just be with every heart. Be with everyone that's there, Lord, and with, with Alan as he brings them in. Lord, I know what it takes to bring those folks in. Just give him that strength that he needs this morning, the love in his heart for them, Lord, to welcome them right in there. And Father, we give you what you have for us in Sunday school right here too. And thank you for it. Thank you for your grace and your mercy that you've come to save us, Lord, from our sin and give us new life. And Lord, I appreciate the hymn that we sang, Lord, higher ground. You don't want us to settle, Lord, for the low ground, but you want us to always be walking closer to you higher ground, Lord. We thank you for that. Help us as a nation, help us as families, help us as a church, Lord, to stand on that ground, Lord, on the rock. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. I may review just a little bit um, like, we, like we usually do, and I don't know how much more we'll get into, but I want to I try and cover at least one section. Uh, we are going through a, I guess, a series of things that I'm calling hook, line, and sinker. 
And we're looking at how Satan is trying to get into our family, our churches, our nation, wherever it might be. And he's trying to draw us away from the Lord and what we ought to be and what we ought to be doing. And as we're looking at hook, line, and sinker, somebody tell me, who is, as we've looked at it, who's the fisherman? Satan is a fisherman. That's the illustration that we're looking at. Who are the fish in the water? We are. And then as we're the fish in the water, Satan's cast out his bait and his hook into the water, hasn't he? And it's dangling right there. What is the bait? Okay, Elaine says different things for different people. And that's exactly right. He knows what to use to bait each one of you, doesn't he? He knows what you like. He know, knows what you like that's not good for you. And he wants to bait you with that. So the bait for each one of us can be different. He knows what he wants to bring. And then how about the hook? Who knows something about the hook? Somebody tell me something about the hook. Four different hooks, like Paul said. And generally when he hooks us, they're always the same at what he wants to try and do in our life. What are those four things? Family fragmentation. He wants to fragment our family, break up our family. What else? Rebellion. He wants us to have a rebellious heart. What else? Corruption. He wants to corrupt. What else? Evil associations or evil companions. So... And I gave you some drawings and some pictures several weeks ago. And the very last one that I gave of kind of the cartoon character, what was that very last picture of? It was the fisherman that had what in his hands? He had the fish in his hands. And isn't that exactly what Satan wants to do? He wants to bait you, hook you, reel you in, and get you right in his hands so he can control you and do exactly what he wants to do in your life. So, that's what this whole lesson is geared for, is to help us understand the enemy and what we need to do in our families, in our churches, and in our country to stand where we should be standing. Last week, uh, not last week, I guess we had a missionary here, but the week before, we started talking about living preemptively, our preemption, and what does it mean? What is preemption? If we look at the definition of preemption or preemptive. Okay. Elaine said strike first. Okay. Catch him off guard. Any, any, anybody else? <laughs> beat, beat him to the punch, she said. <laughs> beat him to the punch. <laughs> any other? Anybody else say anything? Preemption. Preemptive. I give you a little definition. If you look at right after, uh, it says definition of preemption. Action, it's about halfway down, I think, the page there after the review. Action that makes it pointless or impossible for somebody else to do what he or she intended. To make it impossible for them to do what they've intended to do. Does Satan have some intention in our life? Does he want to do some things? So if we live preemptively, we're looking ahead, aren't we? To what He wants to try and do in our lives. And we want to stay several steps ahead of the enemy, don't we? We do. He does. He, he does. He wants to. You're exactly right. He wants to stay ahead of us, but it's so important for us to stay ahead of him. And I'm going to, a couple of verses that we shared a couple of weeks ago, Ephesians 6, 12. Ephesians 6, 12 says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in, there's a typo there if you're reading what I put on that thing, high places. And we have broke that down before, each piece of that, and I'm not going to do that again. And then 1 Peter 5, 8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, 
And vigilant means that we need to be alert, watchful, avoid danger, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. That's exactly what he wants to do. And I gave you, I kind of went through a story a couple weeks ago in America. How we all know about 9-11. What happened 9-11? Caught us off guard. What happened in America 9-11? Somebody tell me. The towers fell, didn't they? And you know, I actually just watched something on uh, TV last night that was talking about this too. I like some things that history, things that give us history of things that are going on. And it went into right what I talked about a couple weeks ago, that there were some men with the, what's the CIA stand for in America? Central Intelligence Agency. The CIA, what are, what are they supposed to be doing for us? Okay, they're supposed to be watch. They're supposed to be looking at the enemy, all the intelligence gathering of things that are going on in the world that are going to affect us as a nation, right? Many of those men at the CIA told our government officials, presidents and stuff, that there was a new kind of enemy attack that was going to hit America. It was going to happen. They knew that it was going to happen. They gathered all the intelligence. What did the leaders think? They chose not to believe it. We, we've got time, right? We've got time to respond to the things that are going to happen to us in America. Well, what ended up happening was 9-11, a new kind of attack of terrorists upon our soil. Our leaders, some of them were living what? Preemptively. They were looking ahead. They were looking at the enemy and what he was going to do. And we were trying to stay ahead of him. But then there were some of us that were not living preemptively. Some of those ones that had the power, you know, to maybe prevent some of those things from happening. So as we look at that, in our families, we need to be living preemptively, don't we? Because Satan wants to destroy you. He wants to destroy your family. He wants to destroy this church. He wants to destroy America, and it goes on and on what he wants to do. And the Lord wants us to be preemptive in our living. And we're going to look from, and we haven't touched much scripture, have we? But I like to touch the scripture. I like to get into the Bible. We're going to begin to look at a man by the name of Joshua in the Old Testament, because Joshua was a man that did in his life live preemptively preemptively and i'm just this morning and then we'll catch up we'll, we'll pick up here next week but we're gonna i just want to give you a little bit of an introduction to joshua from the old testament and i'm going to ask you a couple questions just to see if maybe you know the answers to some of them If you're on your uh, lesson sheet, it's number two, Roman numeral two, or Joshua. And then number one, who is Joshua? His name means, what does Joshua's name mean? Somebody? Anybody? Jo okay. Josh said courage. Anybody else? What does Joshua's name mean? The Lord is salvation. The Lord is salvation. His name, Joshua, salvation. Right? Salvation. Very good. Very good. Anybody else? Anybody got a scripture that might uh, say any of that? Cecil. Do you got... Okay, Hebrews 4, Cecil's saying. I don't have it in my mind right to go right there where it would say. I think it's 4, 4, 8, 6. See if we got it. Hebrews 4, verse 8. I'm turning there. Okay, we'll see if we got it. It's not it. Uh, then would he not have afterward have spoken of another day? So that's, you know, that's what I was thinking of. 
Right. 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 Yep, the rest and salvation. Yep, it's good because that's picturing of what Joshua is doing coming into the promised land, right, when he leads. So you got it right. I know his name does mean salvation. Where, A, the capital A says, he was born where? From the tribe of Ephraim. That's the tribe that he came from. But where was Joshua born? Where was he born at? You ever thought about that? Where? Dick got it right. Egypt. Some people want to, they don't haven't even thought about it really. Joshua was born in Egypt. The time of the what? What were they doing in Egypt? Slavery, Marcia. Captivity, kind of the captivity to the pharaohs there. That's during the time that Joshua was born. He goes all the way back. He knew what it was like to be in Egypt, didn't he? He did. He knew what it was about to be right there in Egypt. Next thing. Uh, B on, there, on, on your lesson, if you look at it, says, He went through the great events of the Passover, the leaving of Egypt, the parting of the Red Sea and Mount Sinai. He even witnessed the ten what that happened in Egypt. The ten plagues, didn't he? He was a witness to the ten plagues, the Passover, for them coming out of the land, crossing the Red Sea. Remember when they got to the Red Sea area? Mountains on the side. They had Pharaoh and his army behind them. There was nowhere for him to go, and they thought there was no hope. But what does the Lord God do? Opens and parts the Red Sea that they can come across the Red Sea. And then up onto Mount Sinai. Joshua goes right up to Mount Sinai. I want to read a couple of scriptures here. We know that he was Moses' what? What would we call him? Joshua was Moses' minister. That's exactly the word that the scripture says. Minister, assistant, the person right by his side to, to help him with some of these things. We might even call it, uh, see if you've heard, what, what did you say, Marcia? <laughs> sure, uh, we always kind of had the, a word if you're teaching somebody and you were mentoring them, then uh, it was kind of, they were kind of your tutelage, your tutelage. So, you know, Moses is taking him under his wing, isn't he? Being right there to minister and to, to be right with him. Well, I want to read a place in Exodus 24 back there. And I'm going to start and read, I'm going to, I think I'm going to read verse, uh, starting in verse 9. Just an account of them coming up on the mount together. Then went up Moses and Aaron and Nadab and Abihu and 70 of the elders of Israel. And they saw the God of Israel. And there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of a sapphire stone, and as it were, the body of heaven in his clearness. You know, I was just rereading some of these things just this last week. And that, I've read the Bible over and over and over and over and over again, but that stuck out to me. I had missed that. I had never, never caught that one little piece right there that God gives where, and they saw the God of Israel, and there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of sapphire stone, and as it were, of the body of heaven in his clearness. What a great thing it would have been to see some of the things that God allowed them to be able to see. And it goes on, and it says, and upon, and upon the nobles of the children of Israel, he laid not his hand, also they saw God and did not eat and drink. And the Lord God said unto Moses, Come up to me into the mount and be there, and I will give thee tables of stone and a law and commandments which I have written, that thou mayest teach them. And Moses rose up and his... 
just what Cecil said, his what? His minister, Joshua. And Moses went up into the mount of God, and he said unto the elders, Tarry ye here for us until we come again unto you. And behold, Aaron and Hur are with you. If any man have any matters to do, let them come unto them. You know, is, do you notice that he talks about Joshua, his minister? Where was Joshua, his minister, going to go? Was he going to come up on the mount with him? A little further than where they had been right here? It looks like it, you know, it goes to the plural. Did you see that it goes to, what did you say? It, you see the plural? It says, and Moses rose up and his minister Joshua, and Moses went up into the mount of God, and he said unto the elders, tarry ye here for us, us, until we come again unto you, and behold, Aaron and Hur are with you. If any man have any matters to do, let him come unto him. It looks like Joshua was allowed to come up close to, with Moses. I don't know if he went all the way up, but he's up in the areas with Moses as well. I think a lot of times, you know what we do? We forget about Joshua in some of the things that God was allowing him to be able to be a part of in pre preparing his own heart. And Moses, verse 15, Moses went up into the mount and the cloud covered the mount. And the glory of the Lord abode upon Mount Sinai. And the Lord, and the Lord, and, and the cloud covered it six days. And the seventh day he called unto Moses out of the midst of the cloud. And the sight of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on the top of the mount in the eyes of the children of Israel. And Moses went up into the midst of the cloud and got him up into the mount. And Moses was in the mount 40 days and 40 nights. What? I thought about this. What a great event that was going on on Mount Sinai. What a great event. And I think we studied the book of Ruth. It's been several, several Wednesdays ago, actually when we were still meeting at the manor in the basement, we went through the book of Ruth. And you know, we also talked about, that was the time of the judges is when Ruth takes place. But many of these events that are happening, when they come even into the promised land, what's the first city when, they, when Joshua takes them in, what's the very first city that they take? What's it called? Jericho. Jericho is the city. Who was saved in Jericho? Who? Rahab and who else? And her house. Whoever was going to come into her home with her, right there, we're going to be saved from what happened when Israel came in there. Do you know when the spies came in there and stuff? You know what Rahab tells them? We've heard what? We've heard everything that Israel's been doing coming up into this land right here. And I have to think, I don't know, I haven't been to Israel. I want to go sometime, I do, in the whole area and just view all the land so I can get a better picture in my own mind that when we're teaching the Bible, I can have a frame of reference, eyesight, and I can see some of those things. But I wonder this, when the Lord God was upon Mount Sinai, when he was there, those people around that area, guess what? I think it could have been seen from a distance away. They knew there was something happening on Mount Sinai and Moses was there. Do you think that that would cause a little fear in their heart when they begin to come into the land? I think there was things that were visible through all those people that were around. The great God of Israel was making Himself known to many of those people right around. And here is Moses and his minister, Joshua. That's a pretty mighty event, isn't it? Kind of makes me think of an event that happened on a mount in the New Testament. What was that event? Somebody help me. The transfiguration. 
the Mount of Transfiguration. Because the Lord Jesus, Peter, James, and John went up there with him. And what happened to his countenance right before them? They were able to see the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ right there. There's a lot that spoke right there. But do you remember what Peter said later on recalling recalling what happened on Mount or on the mountain of transfiguration? Do you remember what he said? I want to read that script. I want you to see some because it was a great event that Joshua witnessed, that Moses witnessed at Mount Sinai. But Peter gives us just a little we got to turn to 1 Peter, I think it is, or it might be 2 Peter. I got to find it. What is it? It is. Yeah, see if you can find it, Paul. See if we can find the passage. I think it, it's actually 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 15. And I think I'm going to end with this. We just, I don't want to go any longer so we can start greeting some people that are going to be coming in for regular service. Something wonderful. Here's Peter's uh, account and recalling the Mount of Transfiguration. He says, Moreover, I will endeavor that you may be able after my decease to have these things always in remembrance. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we were made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the, what? In the holy mountain. He's going back to the transfiguration, isn't he? And man, wasn't that a marvelous event for Peter, James, and John to have witnessed. What a great thing. Probably just as great as what Moses and Joshua are experiencing but he goes on and gives us a picture of something that i love the next part of the scripture here he says verse 19 we have also a more sure word of prophecy whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in the old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. He says there's something greater than what he saw on the Mount of Transfiguration. What was that that's even greater than that marvelous event? What is it? Who sees it? What is greater than that? Paul, what are you pointing at? The Bible! The Word of God is greater than what they witnessed on the mountain of transfiguration. So I even go back to the Old Testament, to what Moses and Joshua witnessed on the Mount Sinai. The God of Israel making Himself known to them. But He says you have a more sure word of prophecy than even that. You know, I don't know if you're waiting for that great event for the Lord to show himself mighty and great like that where you're going to see him again. But he tells us you can see him in a greater fashion than even that, can't you? Because he has revealed all of himself where? To us through the word of God. And we in our time, when I was praying, I'm glad that the Lord has allowed me to be born in the time and the dispensation that we're in. I call it the church age. Because in the church age time that we're in right now, we've got the full what? Canon revelation of the Word of God. That means we can be there on the Mount Sinai. We can be there on the Mount of Transfiguration, can't we? We can experience the great treasures that are hid in the Lord Jesus Christ, can't we? What a great and marvelous thing that the Lord has done to us. Now, I'm just giving you a little... We're we're talking about Joshua. And he saw some great things. But Joshua didn't have the whole word of God like you and I have right now. And we take it for granted, don't we? A lot of times we take it for granted. We've got it. 
right here. But he was a man of God. And he, there was great things that happened. I'm going to read just a couple more things here just to get through this part and then we're going to be done. If you looked up, uh, one of, he was one of the 12 spies that went out into Canaan, wasn't he? And he was one, one of how many that came back with a good report? Two. Who was the other one? Caleb. Caleb and Joshua come back with a good report. Nobody else does. They are the only two that are alive and able to enter where? Into the promised land because they're good report. Only the two that are alive. So that's a little bit about him. Chosen, he's chosen, Joshua is, as Moses' successor to lead the charge into Canaan. So here we, we're going to leave off right there that Joshua is going to lead the charge into Canaan. And what we're going to look at, it, when he leads the charge, he doesn't just go without preemption. He knows some things. Has he already been to the land? Has he already been there? Has he already scouted it? He has. He's already scouted that land. He's already been in that land. So he's got a little bit that he's already looked ahead to, to what they're going to now do when they enter in. And we're going to see that Joshua lived preemptively in what God did for him as he moves into the land of Canaan. And how we need to live like that in our lives. So next week we'll pick up right there. I'm just going to pray. Father, we just thank you, Lord God, for your word. Lord, we thank you for the power and the might, Lord, that is in your word. And again, I thank you, Lord, for the, the great word of God that you've given us, Lord, that you've preserved it, Lord, for the generation which we are in right here. And you tell us you've preserved it for all generations. Not one jot, not one tittle will pass away, Lord, from your word. We thank you so much for it. You've shown us uh, uh, just a little piece of what Joshua and Moses saw there on Mount Sinai. And Lord, you gave us just a little piece of what Peter, James, and John saw on the Mount of Transfiguration as you were transfigured before their eyes. But Lord, we also have a more sure word of prophecy that you've given us. Your word, Lord, because we can come to you from the very beginning of Genesis, Lord, where all things began, to all the way to the revelation, Lord, where you show us the consummation of how all things will come to pass. Lord, what a great God you are. What a great Savior that you are. And we thank you so much for your word this morning. Lord, help us in our lives. Help us, Lord, to live preemptively and to begin to look out, Lord, in our lives and our families' lives. And see how Satan's trying to interfere, Lord. And how we can be steps ahead of him in our preparations and walking with you, Lord. We give you the Sunday school hour. We thank you for it, Lord. Again, we pray that you would be with us in our service, Lord, right here as we lift up your name. And Lord, that you'd be with Grandpa Allen as he's up there at the nursing home getting folks ushered right in there, Lord. Be with him in a great way uh, this day, Lord. And we give it to you in Jesus' name. Amen.